Our next guest this morning is corporate insolvency and restructuring expert Mark Corder. Mark began his career at former global accounting powerhouse Arthur Anderson, making partner at age 31 before joining forces with Mark Mentha in 2002 to co-found legendary advisory and investment group Corder Mentha. Mark is interim co-president of the Collingwood Football Club, where he has served for nearly 14 years as a board member and is also an advisory board member of Swinburne University's Faculty of Business and Law. Mark, it's a pleasure having you on the program this morning. Thanks for your time. Let's start with the current environment. How have you as a business found the past 12 months? Yeah, Rob, it's been really interesting. If I went back to March 2020, you would think that um, our restructuring business would be you know, fully sold out and probably other business like our investment banking business would probably naturally scale back. We've found it's actually been quite the opposite. There is so much money in the system that, um, you know, our restructuring busy, business is, is busy, but our investment bank is, is more busy. So it, it sort of defies the logic where we started off. So I think the weight of money, the cost of money um, has certainly, you know, even though we had a dip in the economy, has certainly been you know, good for everybody. Um, not sure when we're going to pay it all back, but it's been good at least for the last 12 months for, for most people, except obviously if you're in the tourism or small business industry. At the beginning of COVID, there was significant commentary and speculation surrounding the collapse of businesses in, in almost all sectors. To what extent have you seen distress in the business sector over the past 12 months? So in March, April, we um, were working probably around the clock, helping companies and holding their hands and sort of using the phrase, you know, get into care and maintenance, preserve your cash, etc. You know, JobKeeper came along, which was um, save many, many businesses. So you know, it was really tough in, in, in March and April. Um, but as you can see for the results season, broadly we recovered very quickly. But gee, you know, there's some, there's some bit of damage out there, particularly, particularly in Melbourne with the, with the lockdown. So um, I suspect, you know, there'll be a lot of people you know, in the city that won't open again. Equally, there's been a lot of speculation about the end of JobKeeper in, in late March and the impact that that may have. What's your sort of reading on that? Do you think it will be as big of an impact as they're making it out to be? It's really hard to forecast in, in this difficult environment. Um, I think probably not. Uh, I, I think there will be um, issues. You know, we have a healthy system where, where good companies grow and other companies will fail and let other companies grow, but probably not as big as people thought it would be. How should businesses be positioning themselves, say, over the short to medium term to remain solvent and, and profitable? I think it's like always, you know, you focus on your customer and you focus on your, your financial position. So um, lots of change happening. It feels like, you know, interest rates are so low, that's given the cash flow um, or stabilised the cash flow of many companies. But broadly on the solvency, you know, cash is king, preserve your cash. But again, you've got to get out and compete. You've got to grow your market share. You've got to get your people right. You've got to get your customer focus. And you know, more importantly, you know, digitisation and getting your systems right. So um, you're going to have to invest in the future as well as covering the, the ups and downs of the present. How would you evaluate the, the leadership of state and federal governments over the past uh, 12 months or over this COVID period in particular? I haven't heard too many kind words said about the Victorian government, but what's your take on the leadership at state and federal? You only have to look at what could have been. When you look at the COVID rates and deaths overseas, I think broadly most people would say, we're glad we didn't end up there. I think there has to be no further you know, dramatic lockdowns. I mean, the last five day lockdown was not good for small business, right? Maybe there are better ways to do this and clearly we need to improve quarantine, but broadly you can be critical, but if you look at where everybody else was at, you know, I think we should tick that box. Let's talk about Mark Corder, the person. Your family fled Czechoslovakia in 1946 to build a, a better life here in Australia. Take me through your upbringing in, in, in Melbourne, in Australia, and, and what your earliest impressions were. My father left in 46 and he found um, a girl in Brunswick and married her and moved to Nutterwadding in, in um, 56 and I was, was born a year later. So, so I lived all my childhood in Nutterwadding. Um, 
went to Whitefriars College, which, um, which was great, and then went on and did a, um, a Bachelor of Business at Swinburne University. So my mother was really interesting because she um, went back to work while she had four children, um, got a licence when she was 50, uh, and she went back to work basically to pay for our education. What were you like as a student and, and where did the interest in, in business and accounting specifically originate from? I think I got 51 for English, so I just scraped into, into, into Swinburne. I think probably I've always worked, so I think I've had a part-time job since I was about 13 at Coles and then mowing lawns for various car dealerships and had my own small business erecting garden sheds. So I've always had that sort of interest. I didn't do accounting at, at um, Whitefriars, but I wasn't very good at chemistry or physics, so uh, I found my way to Swinburne, which is uh, was, was a really good um, institution for me because I'm very practical, hands-on and career orientated. So I wouldn't have got into Melbourne University anyway, but it, it was a great institution for me as a person. And following your studies, you joined accounting firm Arthur Anderson, age 20. Take me through your, your early career and experience at Arthur Anderson. What, what sort of things were you working on? So I was um, fortunate to get a job offer from Arthur Anderson. The first six months were pretty tough. I think I might have been rated a D my first six months. And maybe that was, you know, you're pretty young, etc. But after that, I seemed to go reasonably well. It was a global firm, you know, a great firm. Um, I'll give you an example, they had, it was one firm, all the partners were in the one firm. And you know, through that I got, and through mentorship and the partners helping us, you know, I got to go to uh, work in Los Angeles, an exchange program, and then later on to work in London. So it, it was a great firm where we got great training and great international experience. You know, you're talking 30 years ago, right? So, and they made big investments in their some 11 years later, age 31, you were made a, a partner of Arthur Anderson. How, do you, how did you progress through the firm so, so rapidly? Well, I think probably, you know, it was a little bit rapid. These days it takes a lot longer to get to partner, but in those days it was you know, a little bit rapid, but not that rapid, Rob. I think, you know, we just worked hard and then Arthur Anderson had decided to um, move into various different service lines other than audit and tax. One of those was restructuring. Um, I hadn't done restructuring before, but they said, you know, I was in corporate finance at the time, would you like to work with Mark Mentha and another partner and, and grow our restructuring business in Australia? So they backed me and my business skills to set up a division with Mark. And talk to me about your, your friendship and, and obviously your business partnership with Mark Mentha, when did you two first meet and how did you become good friends, colleagues and, and later business partners? So Mark was at Arthur Anderson as well and as in all those days he used to start in the audit practice. Um, I was a couple of years more senior than Mark but broadly when I made partner I joined Mark in the restructuring business and we've been working together every, ever since. What makes it work? We are different, you know, I'm pretty good administrator and pretty good at running a business. Mark is a fantastic businessman. We're both business, but he's fantastic at business. He's great at relationship and he's great with people. So we've got this a good combination of skills. I think probably the most important thing and one of the values we have at Cordamenta, one person can live so much, two people together can live so much more. And that's been the essence of, of our success, I think. Um, you know, that, if I had to define the one value. And fast forward to sort of mid-2001, Ansett Airlines collapses, I think it was in, in September actually. But talk, talk to me about why the, the business collapsed and then how uh, Arthur Anderson with you at the helm was, was appointed to the role. September 11 had occurred and the directors of Ansett put the company into administration. Um, then there was a meeting of creditors and a federal court order that Mark and I would replace those administrators um, for various reasons. So Mark and I ended up being the administrators, their personal appointments of ANSET. Um, at the time it was losing around a million dollars a day. 
um, had been grounded the previous Easter by uh, CASA. And of course, September 11 had happened and all planes were grounded around the world. We took over an airline that the previous administrators had grounded, began the enormous task of trying to work out what to do with ANSET. And there was, you know, Sky, what is now SkyWest and Rex and all those airlines engineering. It was about 14,000 people. So it was, um, it was a pretty difficult task, that's for sure. In, in amongst all of that, I think about a month later, Arthur Anderson collapsed. And as you said, yourself and, and Mark Mentha were personal appointments. So talk to me about that period and, and the, the launch of Quarter Mentha in early 02. So, yeah, so Arthur Anderson, around that time while we were running ANSET, was indicted in the US for the um, audit of Enron. And that became a series of events where, notwithstanding it was an unbelievably good firm, worldwide firm, it started to, to, to break up. Mark and I were working 24-7 actually out of the ANSET building and uh, had our hands full with that and a few other clients had our hands full with that. And Mark and I thought, think, well, what about, you know, the future of our team and what we, what we can do? Eventually, um, we decided to set up our own firm. And so we had some clients other than ANSET. About 50 people joined us in uh, mid-April 2002. Um, the rest is a bit of history. The other, I think it was about another 110 partners at Ernst and Young, of Arthur Anderson then went to Ernst & Young around July, August in 2002. So, you know, six or seven months in our, in our lives where um, we had... Um, we had ANSET, we had uh, Arthur Anderson and we had Court of happening sort of all at the same time. As you said, um, given this was Australia's largest corporate collapse at the time and, and may still well be, how significant was the toll that it took on you and, and, the, and the company? I think I read that yourself and uh, Mark Mentha were pretty much sleeping at the office for those six or seven months, um, having to front the media every day. What sort of toll did it take personally on you and on the employees of, uh, of ANSET? The toll on the employees of ANSET was significant, right? Lots of people lost their jobs. Lots of people lost their careers. Mental health, which is talked about a lot these days, wasn't those days. Mental health issues were enormous. And unfortunately, there were you know, quite a number of suicides. The toll on the ANSET people was enormous. Um, for Mark and I, sure, it was long work for particularly the first six months. A little bit after that, that was, you know, difficult on the home life, but there was, you know, there was a light at the end of the, the, the end of the tunnel, right? It was hard, but nothing like what the people did that lost their jobs. Fast forward to 2016, Australian mining and materials company Arium Group collapsed, owing some 2.5 billion to various institutions, with Quarter Mentha being appointed as administrators. Where do you start when you're appointed on something of this scale? That was a very large job, right? I mean. It was um, spending $100 million a week, had 6,000 employees. So where do we start? We start with actually strategy, right? And so we get a number of the key partners together and we go, OK, what is really, really going to be important on Arium? Number one, if we don't have cash, it has to be liquidated and there'll be 6,000 jobs left. So you get a group of people that will go in with management and the first thing we'll do is completely control the cash flow of the company. No one can order anything, no one can pay for anything without this centralised group. So all of a sudden you get control of your expenses very, very quickly. The second thing was why Alice Steelworks, losing a lot of money, a township of 23,000 people depend on that, big significant issue. So Mark Mentha, who I said before, you know, great with people, great with unions, great business person. He picked up two teams, one to work on steel and one to work on mining. I went to Wyla basically with that team for 18 months to fix that. Then we had the East Coast business, very good business, supplying most of the, a lot of the steel to infrastructure in Australia. So we had partners out of the Sydney office look after that. And the jewel in the crown was a company called Mollycop, worth about a billion five. We had a, a team put on that to um, was an administration, but we owned the shares in it to get that sold and to 
re-input that cash to pay down the creditors and save the rest of the business. So basically we have a three point plan and we execute that in four divisions. So lots of minor issues, lots of other things, but strategically, what do we need to do? And we could put that plan, because we didn't have a lot of notice, we put that plan in place. Is that a formula that you use for other situations that works well? So typically we have the three point plan, which is stabilise the business, work out what we're going to do, what's in the best interest of all the creditors. And the third point is then deal with you know, ASIC issues, directors' wrongdoings and all that after the event, right? Tend to follow that formula, but we've got to, you know, deal with the really important issues. The other thing is the people issues are really important in these things, right? I mean, we have a full-time psychologist at Corda Mentha, you know, for use internally and use on engagements because the people aspects of business now are so important. You know, we need that skill base. So Yvonne's been with us, I think, 15 out of the 18 years. That's how important we think people issues are in any business. It's extremely rare to have in any organisation, even these days, let alone 15 years ago. Where, where did that idea come from? Probably from a recognition that, you know, we don't, you know, psychology, understanding humans is, is not our core skill. And we needed a lot of help on that and understand that. So that's where it started from. There's also been several high profile turnaround and restructuring cases Cordamenta has worked on, including Fitness First, Network 10 and, and Bluestone Group, to name a few. Based on your experience, what are the most common mistakes that businesses make? They don't focus on cash flow. Um, the number of times we'll go into a business like on Channel 10 where they have profit and loss and balance sheets and that coming out of the years, but no one really understands the underlying cash flow of the business. So usually on day one, We'll set it up under cash, and then we'll add our debtors and creditors to work out what's, you know, what the financial statements look like. So, um, focus on cash is important. There could, there usually are a few external events that come together to cause um, an event. Some of those are not controllable. So, if you look at this, you know, pandemic, I mean, some people are going to not survive because they have no revenue and then they don't have the financial resources to restart, right? And that's highly unusual. But most of these companies tend to have a series of one-off losses over many years. So they become one-off losses. So um, Poor management is, is another one. Um, but I think change is probably occurring so, much, so quickly now. That's high on the agenda. You probably wouldn't have seen that 20, 25 years ago, the pace of change and the pace of digitisation. I mean, look, look, even in you know our lifetime, you know, one of the great things that happened to business was the fax machine came in. Well, the fax machine doesn't exist any longer. So there you go, in a you know, spate of 20 years, something that was fantastic for business has come and gone. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think the pace of change will, will um, is, uh, is a big issue. On the flip side of that, what are the fundamentals to running a successful profitable organisation. I mean, you come across all types of organisations. The ones that are successful, are they lean, you know, not bloated with, you know, too many staff, nimble, agile to move, that sort of thing? So, Rob, why don't I confine my um, comments to professional services firms? I think that's probably my, my real area of expertise. In a professional service firm, all you've got is you've got your clients, your people, and what I call your roads and rail your infrastructure, right? And so everything we do, we can relate to one of those things. So when we set up our values, what are our values relating to our clients? What are our values relating to our people and our infrastructure? People don't understand. You've got to have good roads and rails to work, right? And we were a Microsoft shop. You know, we never missed a beat because we have such good roads and rails through our technology people, right? So then you get down to, okay, what is about your clients and your people in a professional services firm? What are your values? Um, you know, what, 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 how are things done around here, right? That's, that's really what's important. Um, you've got to pick your market segments. But I think in a professional service, you've got to be very good at what you do. So I think competence is really important. Culture is an overused word, word sorry, but 
I said to you before, we have an in-house psychologist. Her role is to check and monitor and help develop our culture. Right? And then I think the last thing, and this forms part of our strategy, is execution. We all know what we need to do. We just need to do more of it. Yeah. So it's not that you know, particularly difficult, but um, they're the essence of what I've learnt over the years. Reflecting on your career, what are the proudest achievements or assignments that you've worked on? So I think, if we look a little bit backwards, Arium was no doubt uh, an unbelievable achievement, right? Um, particularly driven by Mark Mentha, which was saving the wireless steelworks and saving that town. That's what they set out to do. Obviously, it was good for the creditors, um, but that was destined for a, a close down and really you're going to have an intergenerational um, problem in Wyala. Um, well, it's not there yet at the end of the day, but, you know, we're five years through. So I think that was really proud. ANSET was another one which was difficult. We weren't able to keep the ANSET mainline airline in business. Today you would because they're private equity firms. So if you look at today versus 20 years ago, um, Bain Capital, great private equity firm, have got the capital to put into Virgin. At ANSET in those days, the only people who put capital in were the other international airlines and they were all bleeding because of September 11. We did put Kendall together with Hazleton, which is now called Rex, still going. We did um, restructure Skywest, still a public company and going. Answered Engineering, we ran for five years and formed part of John Holland. So there were lots of businesses saved. Um, so that worked out well. And we got the employees back 96 cents of the dollar. So they're probably the two great achievements. You mentioned airlines there. First of March, I believe, Rex is starting their Golden Triangle Melbourne, Sydney, Brisbane flights. Um, how difficult is it running an airline? We saw the collapse of Virgin Group last year. How difficult is it running a, a, an airline, do you think? And, and how successful do you predict that Rex will be with their new capital city routes? You know, airlines are difficult to run. It's very competitive. Because you think as long as the aircraft manufacturers keep on making planes there'll be more and more airlines in the world. So it's a strategic issue. Um, Australia has always been, leaving aside regional, 2.1 airlines. So you think Impulse disappeared, there was various others along the way, um, you know, Tiger. It's always been 2.1. So I would just take that on board if I was a, a new competitor coming in. Let's uh, move towards real estate. Beyond the insolvency practice, Quartermentha is active in the commercial property funds management and real estate advisory sectors. Take me through your capabilities as a, as a firm in that regard. Sure. We're probably an unusual firm in that we have um, 35 to 40 tertiary real estate, tertiary qualified real estate personnel. We do a lot of um, workout work when that's busy. So, for example, we probably built out, sold or managed five billion dollars worth of real estate on the Gold Coast during the GCF, right? So we have the real estate expertise combined with the restructuring expertise, put them together and you know, our proposition is, is is pretty good. That's developed over the years and we have a and our funds management business, which uh, you know will shortly have about four hundred million dollars under management. Yeah, it's not bad. We only started two and a half years ago. So yeah, so we're an unusual practice in and we don't do agency. And we don't do valuations. We, we're a professional service provider. Um, we also do um, some of our own developments, either if they're larger, you know, like we've got one on the Gold Coast, we do with Paul Little as a um, joint venture, or if they're smaller, we'll do our own our own balance sheet. So they're, they're selective, they're opportunistic. We, we we see something good that we like. So so. The good thing, even though we're a professional service firm, our consultants are also principals in transactions, right? Or we are principals in transactions. So if a bank wants to come to us or someone, look, can you help us out on a problem development? Yeah, well, go and have a look. We've got 40 apartments we're building in Ivanhoe, so we know what we're doing, mm -hmm. not just theoretical consultants. 
<laughs> An observation made to me recently was how COVID has shown that essentially real estate is extricably linked to financial markets, the broader economy and, and society. In some sectors, capital growth rates are falling as, redu as a result of reduced rental income, and hence real estate owners are, are coming under increasing liquidity pressure. Would you agree with that thesis? As you know, Rob, the, the real estate market consists of many thousands of sub-segments. Sub, sub um, but probably the one overriding thing is um, as interest rates go down, property goes up. So if you can go to the bank and get a $1 million loan, the properties are going to be X. Mm. If you can go to a bank and get a $2 million loan because interest rates are falling, the properties are going to probably... Yeah. So it's it's really a, is, is linked to in overall linked to interest rates and the amount of money available. Given the the above and, and what you've mentioned there, would you expect to see distressed buying opportunities either for trading businesses or real estate assets this year? Um, I think because of the weight of money around, probably not. So I mean, the banks you know want their customers. Um, they want to support their customers and when, you know, your interest rates, if you're not in default, a couple of percent plus, you know, BBS W was 30 points a couple of weeks ago, a couple of points of margin, your cash flow will be okay, right? And so you'll get a lot of support and there's probably some room then to pay you down your debt. So it doesn't feel like there's a lot of distress. Where the distress will be is, um, as usual, developers that don't know what they're doing. The stress will come when the builders collapse. It's very hard for a developer to keep going or cover their losses when a builder collapses. And you've got all the warranty insurance issues and all that. So we're seeing a bit of stress in that area. And so there may be some some flow on, right? I think it's the market still to work through, you know, B, C and D grade um, office buildings, um, industrial, you know, what we're looking sub fives down to fours for a block of land and a tin shed. So we might be selling ours soon, I think. <laughs> um, yeah, so it is an interesting market. Do you see um, any any areas that are more vulnerable than others? You mentioned the Gold Coast there, a lot of money pouring in there at the moment. But are there any regional areas or capital city markets that you'd avoid at the moment? I'm still a bit intrigued where um, I guess retail landlords in their various forms, anywhere from the big shopping centres, true to the strip centres are going, right? Um, I think that's pretty vulnerable still. You know, I saw the REITs got you know, particularly smashed in March 2020. They've come back, but, you know, they're going to have to repurpose. We're going to have to repurpose retail space. Do you see any similarities uh, from a real estate perspective as to the current environment now as to that of, of the GFC? The GFC, we had a significant liquidity crisis, right? It was a financial crisis. Yeah, you could see one bank couldn't even trade with another bank. Um, you know, the government did a really, really good job of you know, putting guarantees in place. Um, that helped Australia a lot. So there was a liquidity crisis. Here's quite the, the opposite. The cost of money is almost zero. In fact, it's negative in some countries. And there is so much money around, it's unbelievable. So they're not even comparable. You've had a, an extraordinary career to date. A couple of questions to finish off. What's the next chapter of Cordamentha as a business? You've got 350 staff roughly now. You're operating in pretty much every city across Australia, as well as Beijing and Jakarta on an international front. So what does growth for the firm look like? You know, that's a good question. We, you know, we've been an overnight success over 18 years, right? So it's always been steady as you go. We probably follow the market forces. So, um, you know, we have an investment banking group that's been going, you know, 13 years now, and we've just been creating a, a brand and a reputation in the mid-market, you know, deals of 500 million, but it didn't start overnight. It takes a long time to hire good people, get them into the culture, get a cultural right fit. Um, our forensic business, we started about 12 years ago with two people. 
we don't really buy businesses um, and we try to grow them. Having said that, our funds management business that I talked to you about that's nearing 400 million, we hired two guys into that, that um, X come from X Centro, fantastic people. We could never build that business without hiring those sort of people. Um, so um, we have another number of platform businesses like Buy My Place. So we think um, where are we going to be able to help our clients on the technology revolution, right? And so we've got, you know, 10 odd people in that area and we're just sort of seeing where, where that might go. So for want of a better word, call them into technology. I mean, we won't be in big systems installation, but how are we going to help, you know, medium-sized businesses digitise their businesses and grow? So that's probably where we're going next. Speaking of growth, what levers of the economy need to be pulled to set Australia up for the next period of growth? Um, gee, that's a not an economist, but I, I would have thought um, you want everybody cooperating to grow the wealth of the country through productivity and all that, but also have some right mechanisms where as the pie grows, we can share that pie equitably, right? We're a pretty wealthy country, so if we can keep on growing the pie, but how do we share it and be a bit more inclusive and, and share that pie better, I think that would be good. Final question, how are the pies going to fare this year? I hope very, very well, Rob. Um, look, the, it's interesting that the competition is fierce in the AFL. Uh, you've got many sides that have been rebuilding and you've got, we've probably had five or six years or more of, you know, the com what they call competitive balance, right, with the salary caps and now the football cap. It feels like we're doing the right things behind the scenes, getting the culture right, um, working hard, being a high performance team. But we can do everything we like, but we're in a competition with, 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 um, with all the other teams. So, um, but yeah, we certainly expect to be playing finals this year. Mark Corder, an absolute pleasure having you on. Thanks for your time. Good, thank you, Rob. It's a pleasure.